we have about half an hour. I won't take up too much time in talking myself, but I'll uh, kind of start the conversation with a few questions, and then we can take questions from, from the audience. Um, so just in thinking of, of the two presentations, there's definitely some commonalities, and one was the focus on parties and these organizations, which in both cases were uh, beneficial, although it's very different settings. So one is a transition to democracy in 19th century uh, Europe, and the other one is post-colonial uh, uh, independence. And so just one question is, um, or I guess an assertion is that uh, the benefits that each of you focus on in terms of uh, parties are slightly different, not exactly the same. So uh, you very, very much focused on conservative parties and those being a means for existing elites to buy into the notion of democracy and you focused on stability of parties uh, in this period of, in this transition. So I guess just one question is to, uh, for each of you is, is the other's mechanism also found in your setting? Or you know, are these two separate things? Or kind of is the mechanism that Daniel uh, talked about and uh, also in your setting and vice, and vice versa? So I don't know who wants so to. So just to clarify, yeah. so the, this, this thing about the, the this notion of an inclusive community mm -hmm. or the role of? Well, so, right. so the question would be for you is how important was stability yeah, and I the see. fact that, so, so definitely you talk about conservative parties, is that what was yeah. important? Or parties that provided stability and then in your setting, was there, you know, any, any of the insights from Daniel's setting also relevant? And yeah, do you want to go first? Or? Um, yeah, so I think when we, when we think, so, so much of, de of theorizing about democracy draws on the European um, mm -hmm. examples. And I think one thing we've got to say is that from the outset is that um, the, the colonial, post-colonial states have a very different experience of mm -hmm. state formation. Um, and they have, they don't have the kind of parliamentary political mm -hmm. parties over hundreds of years. Yep. Um, so I think that that's one important difference. Another really important difference is that you don't have, uh, you know, I think we, we talked yesterday about um, states emerging, you know, the Tilly argument, war made the state. Um, and so states precede, in some cases, nations emerging um, by hundreds of years in Europe. And in some cases, nations precede states, perhaps, as in Germany. Um, but th uh, those processes occur in very close chronological proximity. So why does this matter for the question? Mm -hmm. Well, I think in the post-colonial context, at least in, in post-British um, and uh, ex-British colonies, um, you often have the key institutions of democracy. So you don't, have, you don't have the fight from below, mm -hmm. as you do in yeah. Europe, to concede democracy. You often get the basic institutions of democracy through the process of decolonization. Mm -hmm. And then the struggle is, do you keep them? And I think the mechanics of Daniel's argument actually absolutely apply in the case, mm -hmm. which is that the conservatives are inside of the nationalist movement for the most part, because the conservatives are also want colonial independence. So the parties, um, aren't two parties vying, but they're, but they're essentially um, contained within the nationalist movement. Right. Yeah. 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 So picking up on that point about this kind of truncated history in a certain way mm -hmm. of, yeah. of institutional development, I think that is really critical. And, you know, I'm not, you know, so the, the one reading of what I said could be that this is like determined in this, you know, the 17th century, whether or not your parliament, can, the king decided to continue to call the parliament determines whether in the 20th century you have the survival of democracy. And I think that would be pushing it too far. I mean, and this, I mean that scatter plot that I showed, that, you know, that's kind of a loose correlation, right? So I think, you know, I don't want to be a kind of historical determinist about this, you know, and, and part, well, one of the reasons of focusing on parties rather than like the deep history of state building is that I think it is possible to build these institutions. It requires hard work, it requires imagination, it requires political leaders who, ha who, have, who are, can successfully mobilize people. And in fact, if you look at Germany after 1945, you know, this is a country that never had a democratic center right until 1945. It was split over religion. There was no definition of the political community between Catholics and Protestants. After 1945, um, you know, conserv uh, Protestant, conservative Protestants and Catholics, you know, who had some of whom had spent time in concentration camps and prison and prison camps and so on, realized the stakes and the enormity of figuring out how to cooperate with each other and overcame that division. And so I think, you know, and, and did the hard work of going door to door, trying to convince uh, Catholic voters to vote for this new political mm -hmm. party, for instance. Mm 
and I've, I've done some interviews with people who are kind of involved in these early days of the German CDU, the Christian Democratic Party. And you know, you realize this, this is hard work, but it can be done. So I, I think it is possible to build these institutions. I guess what I would say that, you know, I'm trying to sort of understand why the European process looked different within you and why there were differences within Europe. Um, and I guess, you know, it is, it's just it's just the barriers to it perhaps are harder. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think so that the kind of pursuit of democracy is much is more difficult in settings where you have kind of weaker institutions. Um, uh, in terms of the stability point, I think it does promote stability. I mean, at mm -hmm. the end of the day, you know, the, the, the you know somebody like Lord Salisbury, I don't want to glamorize him too much. He was an anti-Semite. He was uh, he was anti-democratic. Um, but you know, you don't. In some ways, you don't get to choose whether or not a society has conservatives. The mm -hmm. question is, what do the conservatives play along? And I think the forces for democracy. So in that sense, conservatives were playing a stabilizing role. The existence mm -hmm. of these parties, yeah. I think, very much much fits with Maya's uh, yeah. description. And it's really the forces were much the forces pushing for democracy were liberals and socialists. Right. And so on. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So I've, I definitely have never thought of parties in this way, and particularly these, these benefits of parties. And so I guess with with everything, there's always positives and negatives. Uh, and so I'd be curious, and we could think around, think about the world today, and there's countries with more or less stability of parties, like the U.S. Uh, is a particular setting where we have two parties that are pretty stable. Uh, are there any negatives associated with parties, and can you sometimes have too much stability in an environment where there's change, and would uh, something which was beneficial in a certain context or a certain historical context be less beneficial? in yeah, modern context. So I can think of one very specific example. In the United States, the way we select our presidential candidates. Mm -hmm. You know, until 1972, uh, you had, the parties were very strong. And you had these smoke-filled rooms where uh, political leaders got together at conventions and decided who was going to be the best, best candidate for president. And voters had basically no say. Mm -hmm. Primaries were irrelevant. So this is a sign of a strong party. Uh, and I think it was actually quite good in some respects because they, you know, they didn't allow demagogues to come to the top of the ticket. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, these were not very democratic settings. These were not inclusive. These mm -hmm. were not transparent. And so there was a, it's a double-edged sword. So I think in some ways, uh, you know, th th that's a way to think about parties in general, that they contribute to stability. But at some point, you want outsiders to break right. through. Uh, it, but, you know, it's, there's, a, there's also a risk to that. Too. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you have thoughts, if the party's all good. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the way that I outlined um, the emergence of these two nationalist movements, which then become parties, um, are that they do grow, draw from grassroots. Mm -hmm. They have really strong grassroots infrastructure. And I think some of the dangers with parties, including in the countries that I talked about, is that they ossify and that they don't continue to draw talent from below, ideas from below. Um, I think, and I think that has relevance in you know, countries like the United States mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, you know, uh, last year, um, the head of the, um, the Indian National Congress Party came to uh, w uh, where I was, um, I was a visiting professor last year at Berkeley, for, and he came there and, you know, he was asked about, uh, Rahul Gandhi was asked about why, um, you know, why should he essentially be the head of the, of, of the party? Um, and he said, well, you know, that's the way things are, the way things are done in India, it's sort of a, you know, a dynastic system. Um, so I think that that's part, you know, a right. real danger yep. to, um, to, to parties that don't continue to have the thriving um, grassroots infrastructure, in fact, throw up talent and have a real dialogue between mm. the institutions that create consensus um, and the grassroots institutions that, um, that throw up ideas. Right. Yeah, so great. Um, and then just the last question, we can turn it over to, I'm sure people have lots of questions that they're, uh, so the, I guess, you know, the, t the title of your talk was Rise and Fall of Democracies, Lessons from History. And I think for both of your cases, there are likely general lessons to apply to developing countries today, in particular those that are trying to democratize and have slid back, and there's lots of cases of this. Um, so I guess from your own research, do you have kind of as concrete as possible advice that you would give to, you know, uh, emerging democracies and uh, things that we've learned from your, <laughs> it's always a tough question, the yeah. policy question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was I was talking to um, some of my um, uh, Pakistani students, and you know, they were sort of saying, "Look, this is a really, you know, this is a story full of despair from Pakistan." Mm -hmm. um, and I said, "Well, you know, I think over over time in Pakistan, um, this really exclusive national narrative um, has um, has really been a source of distraction," um, and so. Um, 
you know, I, I think it's, it's a, it's, it looks like a hard slog, but I think to, to think about um, inventing, um, to use Frank Fukuyama's term, a kind of creedal nationalism. Um, and it's, it's not as utopian as it sounds. I mean, you know, all of, of stories of nationalism are stories of selectively remembering and forgetting. Um, and there are, you know, historical, um, you know, some of the oldest settlements in the world are currently in what is modern day Pakistan. And to create stories that are not around religion, um, but that are around a kind of a shared, um, a, sh a shared set of beliefs uh, that I, I think is, is, is helpful in orienting the country not on um, kind of divisive questions of, um, of you know, who's a better citizen, but on questions of, of development and, and, um, and growth rather than kind of, you know, yeah. Right, yeah. Zen. yeah. So, I, you know, that's a very broad <laughs> answer, but um, yeah. Yeah, so then. So I, I guess I would make two points. One, that in a place like Thailand where the, the current regime is so frightened of democracy mm -hmm. and, and so that they essentially can't have really democratic elections and let the elections stand, and that's because they think they're going to lose. Um, and so there needs to be an investment in the institutions mm -hmm. of party building. Um, and, you know, and, and, and I think one way that that can happen is this point that I made about people's livelihood becoming tied up in the institutions. I often sort of jokingly think like somebody like David Axelrod you know, has a very successful career as a political advisor, wouldn't do so well in a military regime. You know, he's making a living in a democracy. People's lives and their livelihoods and professional lives get tied up in the regime. And the more people you have connected at a very, in, very basic interest level, the more stable a democracy is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, not to pick on David Axelrod. I mean, there's yeah. probably other reasons why he doesn't <laughs> want a military coup either. Right. But, um, but, you know, I think that's, there, there's something to that. The, the second point I would make, and so, so in, in new democracy, I, I think an, an, this are, there may be a, some kind of myth, well, maybe we don't need parties. I think that's not right. right. Uh, the second point I would make is that parties have to, party leaders have a really important role to keep outsiders who are threats to democracy out. And that's sort of a reoccurring theme that's become apparent in the United States, uh, but in, in all, I mean, the way that democracies break down is often with outsiders who are not committed to the democratic rules of the game, uh, and, but they never come to power on their own. They always come to power with the aid of party leaders mm -hmm. who, um, you know, sort of think there might be some, they have some opportunistic reason to ally with them. And so the party gets hollowed out in a way. Party leaders get hollowed, party organizations get hollowed out. And as a result of that, they're kind of willing to kind of allow demagogues to come right. along. So I think in new democracies, party leaders need to stand up to democratic threats. Right. So, so, so I guess the question is, what do we do if the emerging parties are along ethnic lines or religious lines? Should we then promote, which is often, co which is common, yeah. right? Uh, is, that, is that better than no parties? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't, I mean, there's, I think that's maybe a better question for Maya, because yeah. I mean, she's thought more about these notions of the, the kind of role of national political, the, the sort of conception of the national community. Mm -hmm. I kind of have spent less time thinking about that, but I, I mean, I, you know, you, I think people, you want people to work through parties in any case, so it's mm -hmm. probably better than not working through parties right. at all. But, you know, the, the more inclusive uh, parties are, I mean, parties are coalitions. Coalitions are groups of people who don't agree on most things. And so that's often maybe even on ethnic grounds as well. Right, yeah. Would you agree? Yeah, no, I absolutely <laughs> agree. I mean, having, having, part, I mean, having more organizations a lot is a fundamental, um, I think, precondition for getting to consensus. Mm -hmm. And so if you can do that along ethnic lines, but then still um, have political systems by which you're forced to make some compromises, mm -hmm. Yeah, then it's better than, it's better, than yeah. better than not having institutions that create consensus at all. Right. Yeah. Okay, we should open it up for questions. There's yeah, the first hand was up. Was right there. Yeah. <laughs> it's quick. It's yeah. Uh, hello Nelson Ortiz from Venezuela. Uh, I would like to go further to the issue of the uh, two-party system. Uh, you mentioned that uh, in the US after 72 that uh, they evolved the way uh, internally they settled things. But uh, there are other countries that uh, were two-party uh, systems that were functioning and working very well, but they evolve to a multi-party or uh, several party systems. And uh, my empirical evidence is that uh, they became less stable. Democracies start to function less well. Okay, Venezuela is one of them, even Colombia now, Spain while they had to, uh, while you look to other countries that are still two-party, uh, England, basically, Germany, whatever, they tend to be more stable. 
So is that not a paradox that uh, if there are more parties, democracy tend to work um, less well? Um, well, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good observation, you know, and, and, it go, there is an obs there's a, and it goes back to the kind of study, I mean, I study European politics, the study of Weimar Germany, which was a system with incredible number of political parties, purely proportional system, in which you had fragmentation and dysfunction in the parliament, which invited uh, a demagogue and made the appeals of a demagogue that much greater. So I think there is the risk of too much fragmentation being a danger, and, and, and you know, people are kind of aware of that, I think. You know, what, after 1945, what happened in Germany was the introduction of various thresholds, like in a 5% threshold, for instance, which, you know, requires you get at least 5% of the vote. And so, you know, it, there's lots of, for all the cases that you just mentioned of unstable democracies with multi-parties, I can give you lots of examples of stable democracies with multi-parties, Germany, uh, Sweden. I mean, there's, other, you know, so this is uh, Belgium. I mean, they, these are, you know, relatively stable democracies. And so I think that there's no kind of ironclad rule between the number of parties and the instability of democracy. At the outer edges, certainly the more, if you have extreme fragmentation, this is, this is uh, dangerous. But I think it's also possible to have extreme polarization. I think that's really the key factor. Do you have polarization where the parties regard each other as enemies? And this happens, it can happen in two-party systems, and I think it's increasingly happening in the United States. And it can also happen in multi-party systems. So I think to me, that's the more, that's the kind of most uh, worrying development that, that maybe cuts across the factor that you've just identified. Okay, great. Uh, Ahead. Could you maybe talk a little bit about the deinstitutionalization of parties? That is, the the one person party that. Uh, um, well, I mean, I think that's that's been a uh, that's been a trend for a long time in the cases that I study. Um, that there's been essentially. Um, strong men emerging, um, and um, but I think that's, um, and I think that, that you know I think according to the arguments I've made, and I think we are seeing that play play out today, and um, uh, particularly in India, you you are seeing um, uh, concentration of power in um, the the leaders at top, and that is de deinstitutionalization because the party. It's not the party that's selecting essentially um, leaders. It's it's kind of populist appeals, um, and um, in India's case, there are some uh, sort of social movements that are helping to um, from that are not necessarily within the parties, but are helping to to uh, uh, essentially deinstitutionalize the processes of of leadership selection. Um, I mean, it, it's not good for democracy. Obviously, I mean that's you know. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I would add one one other thing that you know. In some ways, one of the factors I th you, know, it's, it, you could sort of think of the U.S. Although we do have two strong parties, mm -hmm. one of the things that's interesting to track is the number of contenders uh, in the Democratic primary process and the Republican and Democratic Party primary process. So you have a kind of proliferation of the number of candidates. I mean, this is obvious this year in the Democratic Party, we have like 17 people running. This is also, so if you actually track over time from 1972 to the present, the number of people running is increasing, which, I, which makes it harder and harder to kind of come to a rational decision. Uh, and so one thing that I've sort of suspected that lies behind this, and this is a form of deinstitutionalization or a single per person kind of staying in, even though they're not going to win for a really long time, is I, I think it's driven in part, this part of the fact, one factor is the kind of levels of economic inequality. I mean, at some level, you sort of think that if every politician has their own billionaire backer, they can stay in politics much longer. And so as you have a proliferation in the number of billionaires, uh, somebody can stay in the primary process for a much for a much longer time than they would otherwise. Normally, you, you know, you have to get resources and you can't survive. And so, I think economic inequality actually, in fact, per perhaps just a hypothesis here, exacerbates this problem. Right. I think the next question was right. The next person. Yeah. Thanks. Um, my name is Anne Bernstein. I'm from South Africa, and I'm delighted that you have this session on political parties. I think they're, they're really vital for democracy, and we spend far too little time thinking about them. And one of the issues that I wonder if you have any thoughts on, you know, on the one hand, you have India with the liberation movement, now a rather strange dynasty, the Congress Party, which may or may not come back. 
um, or its best days are behind them. Um, South Africa, you have the ANC very similar in many ways. It's not a political party. It's a liberation movement that governs the country and very hard to run such a party. So the question really is one about why do we have, it seems, less information about parties in the developing world uh, than, than I think we need, but also it's how you run the political party. So I'm sort of interested in the opposition in South Africa, for example, which has grown from a very small party to now a big party. And the, the problems of how you run a political party in a democratic way, in a big country, in diversity, are not simple. Um, so I wondered what experience you have, both from history, the British sort of system particularly, but maybe others in Western Europe, but also from other countries in Asia. I think how you run democratic political parties, which are so vital as sort of training grounds for democratic practice. Yes, well, I, I think, you know, I describe these kind of obscure institutions in my talk, and some of you may have been wondering, well, why am I learning about the party whip, and, you know, is this really relevant, or the patronage secretary? But what I was trying to emphasize is the degree to which those were innovations in the 19th century. These are things that people invented. I and mean, we tend to think of engineers inventing things. We don't really think of politicians inventing things. These are forms of organization, new forms of organization that were incredibly effective to address the particular circumstances in which people were living and the needs at that time, institutional needs at that time. So I think what, you know, and, and when we see, you know, in France, the, essentially the main parties have disappeared from the political landscape. In Germany, you see the German CDU collapsing, the SPD collapsing. Um, you know, you see this across, what, in, in Italy, the main political parties essentially disappeared. The Christian Democrats have disappeared entirely. The, the left is kind of in disintegration as well. You know, so have the days of parties passed? I mean, that would be one way of interpreting this. I think another way of thinking about it is that there are new organizational challenges that are the, equi that are the present day equivalents to whatever the challenges were in the 19th century. And what this requires is creative people thinking about how to solve these problems. And so to be more concrete about this, you know, the, for instance, the role of social media is something that I think, you know, these kind of elephant institutions of like the German CDU or the German SPD haven't quite figured out how to deal with. Um, and so there's new technological challenges, new media challenges. And so this, to me, that's one of the major challenges, but also as people's lives have changed. So if the, you know, the traditional socialist party was based on labor union membership, but as labor union membership just, just you know, drops, you want, in the SPD, the Social Democrats still want votes from, from workers. They have to change how they mobilize people. If, you know, people go about their daily lives in different ways than they did in the 19th century. And so parties need to meet people where they li leave their lives the, and the way they consume their media and kind of come up with creative ways of, of being relevant for people. And I think in that sense, parties need to be revamped in lots of ways. And, you know, we see this sort of some signs of it. There's these various liberal movements in, in Europe, these kind of new groups that are coming up that are trying to kind of cope with this kind of changed landscape and doing it quite effectively, but they're still at the margins. And I think the main parties themselves, just like firms when faced with a new marketplace, have to adapt. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to? Yeah, um, I mean, I think there are a couple questions there. I think there was a question of why do we know so little about party processes outside of Europe? And I we think haven't read your book. That's the, <laughs> <laughs> the book you know. No, no, that's not what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> I'm saying, um, yeah. No but, but I, no, but I do really see, I think that, you know, partly there is, um, there is, I think, a, a justified reason to, f to focus on p party building in Europe, partly because, um, you know, as uh, the African National Congress and the Indian National Congress are looking to build their parties, they are also looking to Europe. So there are processes of emulation, um, or, or right, or mm -hmm. Trump. Um, but I all, I, I, you know, so. But this, a second question you asked is kind of what do we know about? best practices, and I know that that is a dirty word almost in this room, right, but um, from, from the session earlier, but I, but I do think that um, we can think, one of the things that happens is when you have these kind of nationalist movements is that they have an incredible amount of legitimacy because they stood for the nation. And they kind of left, rest on their laurels in the decades after that. Um, so, for example, in, in the case of India, um, you have, well, in the case of Pakistan, the, the Muslim League is, is actually kind of, you know, sidelined very quickly. But in the case of India, 
um, the Indian National Congress stops, stops having internal elections, and I think it's the 1970s. Um, the, there is um, the youth wing of the party kind of falls into disrepair, and I think those are two really critical um, parts because if you're not if you're if you're not having a system internally of having the party represent people from essentially at the grassroots level, and you're also not um, getting you know the youth involved and in understanding what are the you know what are the political issues of the day what do they care about um, then I think parties really begin to ossify so I think those are kind of two institutions as well as some of the ones that um, that that Dan mentioned that I think really, really do matter for um, the healthy functioning um, of democracy and I think you know in some ways it was instructive to look um, it's hard to imagine this now, you know, right when we're going to Indian elections. But in uh, at the last election, the national election in India in 2014, um, if you looked at how the major um, candidates for the respective parties were selected, it's actually really it's a really interesting um, point to look at the process because um, it was without question for Indian National Congress going to be um, Rahul Gandhi, who was uh, the great great grandson of the first prime minister. Um, and for um, the opposition party, the BJP, the, con the conservative party, um, it was, um, there was this real um, kind of leadership struggle that played out in very public ways about who the prime ministerial candidate was going to be. Um, and it wasn't clear, um, you know, six months before the election, uh, whether that was really going to be Narendra Modi. Um, now that looks kind of incredible, but um, it's worth remembering that history. And that's a part of, of the, you know, the, the, the party really um, playing a big role. Great. So we'll take one from this side of the room, just right there in the black. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to d disperse the. <laughs> Thank you. Um how do we explain, like, uh, I think uh, sometimes uh, uh, parties are a vehicle for an individual to uh, get to power. And then how do you explain uh, leaders like Lee Kuan Yew, uh, Mahathir Mohammed, uh, who has bypassed all the expert theories and then kind of uh, come to the top. And then now you have rule of law in, in Singapore and one of the exemplary countries in the world. But 30 years ago, uh, the West would have uh, declared them as dictators. Now they call them benevolent dictators. So how do you explain individuals uh, changing the scope of history? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, you know, I think leadership matters extraordinarily, but leadership matters when institutions are created, and particularly party institutions. Um, someone like Yee, Lee Kuan Yew, um, you know, I think what, if one of the things I hope you, you know, take from my talk is that these founding moments are incredibly consequential. Um, and Lee Kuan Yew, um, you know, he builds, um, you know, from from really nothing uh, 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 a party, but also, but that, that where the party and the rules really matter, which I think is very consistent with what we're saying. He wasn't afraid to arrest his friends if they were corrupt. Um, and um, now it's it's not a democracy, um, uh, but I would argue that it's it's actually an outlier in the sense of having strong institutions, having st a rule of law. The reason it's not a democracy is because it doesn't have competition, uh, but it does have broad protection um, for of civil liberties, which I think is a constitutive element of democracy. Yeah, I just would say the same thing that the, that these are not democracies. You can have rule. There's a difference between rule of law and being a, an a, a inclusive democracy where there's competition for office. And I guess I'm really thinking of systems in which there are, I, I happen to prefer to live in that kind of system where there's competition and inclusive uh, democracy. You know, r rule of law is important too, obviously. But so I, I'm trying to think about the factors that give rise to stability within democracies where there's competition for office. And so it's a, it's a different dynamic, although obviously it's an important country and so on as well. And actually, but can I just say, I mean, I think it's worth saying, I think this was it's emphasized um, in, in various sessions so far, there's an incredible focus on kind of the Chinas and the Singapores. Um, but I think, you know, the research is, is, is pretty clear that democracies on average grow faster. Now, you can look and you think, oh my God, China and Singapore are doing so well. Um, and there are, there are autocracies, you know, they don't, um, but there's no guarantee you're gonna get a Lee Kuan Yew or that you're gonna get a, a kind of a CCP magically um, appear, right? Um, and I think that one of the things that both Dan and I are saying is that building these parties are long, difficult um, processes 
And um, it does take uh, <coughs> leaders often at form foundational moments at Lee, like Lee Kuan Yew to create those kind of institutions. But on average, um, democracies do better um, at, at many of the things that um, I think people in the room do care about. So it's not just a normative argument. I just add one other thing is that, you know, I often, you know, in the present day, it's often tempting to kind of look at the kind of dysfunct, the apparent dysfunction function of British politics or American politics and say, God, you know, do we, is democracy really worth it? <laughs> um, but I think what's interesting about democracy is that there's se systems of self-correction that exist. And the problem is they happen very transparently. So, we, so it's like watching a family fight with all the curtains open. You, know, you can mm -hmm. see the fight taking place. And so you can draw the conclusion this is dysfunctional. Whereas authoritarian systems, the curtains are closed and you don't see the fights. And so that's why authoritarian regimes, when they collapse, they tend to collapse instantly. I mean, the, the surprise with which the Soviet Union collapsed within several months or the whole Eastern Bloc, it happens because nobody sees the fights taking place. And so, you know, we should not be misled by the presence of fights and apparent dysfunction, because often this is the kind of processes of self-correction at work. Okay, well, I'll take a question from this side if there is one. If not, no, if not, right there, you're next, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mauricio from Mexico. Uh, in Mexico, we have seen uh, people running for office without a political party. We currently have a governor who's not represented by a party. And unfortunately, it has been a, a disaster in the sense that, I mean, he cannot get anything across because of Congress and so forth. So that's one thing. On the other hand, we have uh, over 10 political parties. And so elaborating on Nelson's comment, that hasn't been also good for democracy in any way. So my question would be, do you have any examples from other countries where citizen-led initiatives without the support of a party have been successful? Because also the thing what, that we're seeing is people are waiting for a, a messiahs to come and solve all our problems. And what type of citizen-led initiatives can collaborate with parties to solve the problems? Yeah, so I can think of some historical examples uh, in, from the U.S. as well as some contemporary examples from Europe. So if we think about the progressive movement in the United States, which was in the late 19th century, early 20th century, I mean, these were often uh, citizen-led movements, often prominent citizens uh, who were upset about the quality of the state and the kind of quality of the bureaucracy and the, and the kind of nature of corruption and clientelism in American politics. And these people organized uh, and th so they, these were, this was citizen movements, but what's interesting about this is that in order to really affect the change, they tend to have to form coalitions or c try to access political parties, because at the end of the day, these are the groups that are making the decisions. So these social force, you know, so, and political parties see these movements out there and see an opportunity to tap into these genuine social movements. So I think there's been examples of that where you've affected major democratic changes and changes, reforms of the state, initially coming from citizen Led movements. I think similarly in, in Western Europe over the last 30 years, the Green Movement was essentially initially, I mean, these were people who were allergic to political parties and, and really and continue to be kind of allergic to kind of the hierarchy of political parties. And it's a real a social movement that eventually very kind of in a difficult way forms a party and eventually serves in government, you know, in the late 1990s. So uh, again, I think that, that these, these movements begin often at the grassroots, but at the end of the day, at least in these systems that I'm describing, where you have their, you know, continue to be pretty well institutionalized, they need to match up and, and, form, and form coalitions with political parties. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm gonna essentially echo what Dan said. <laughs> so, um, but I, you know, there are some examples. Like in in, um, in India, there was a new political party, um, the Aam Aadmi Party, or AAP, uh, that got started. Now, it depends what you, you know, what do you define as successful? I mean, sometimes social movements, um, you know, they don't have to necessarily go and create new political parties. But I think, as Dan said, they have to. Um, that's one option, but the, but if another option is simply to put a lot of pressure on existing political parties um, to to change their policies, as you know, let's say the Me Too movement is doing in the United States, it isn't creating a party. It's a social movement, but it's put an incredible amount of pressure, I think, on uh, on parties, on how parties collect their candidates, the way candidates behave themselves, and so forth. And that hasn't been through a formal coalition of any kind. Okay, so we have time for about one more, one more question, um, if there is. Uh
Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> And, and see how you respond to that. So two parts to it. One is, as much as one can play the inclusion versus exclusion narrative, and that's one read, but an alternative read could be whenever there's a minority group, what, what we call inclusion is forced assimilation, what we call exclusion is protection. And so the narrative on the Pakistani side is very different uh, on that. And the reason I kind of raise that is, one of the things which you kind of missed in your, in your thesis, which I think would be very interesting, is when you think of the parties, when you think of the elected officials on the Pakistani side who, who led Pakistan post-independence, their constituencies were actually in India. Right. So when you think of Liaquat Ali Khan and others, so this is a very interesting set that a democratically elected group of people no longer have their constituent base because of partition and movement of people. So the first kind of proponents of non-democratic actually uh, ethos is in fact a democratically elected individual and not because of an inclusion or exclusionary protect, uh, protection motivation, but simply because they no longer have that kind of constituent base. So that's a huge element in when you look at the initial uh, conditions. Um, so I didn't quite see that uh, in the narrative. Um, and the second part of the narrative is what about Bangladesh? Uh, which is very interesting because in a lot of ways Bangladesh is on a more impressive growth trajectory than even Pakistan and India are at. Yep. Yet it creates its in initial kind of motivation very much on the same principles of m Islamic ideology as Pakistan does. And so just those two comments, I uh, wanted to hear your actions to both. Great. Um, yeah, those are great, great questions. So. Um, I didn't go into a lot of the, you know, um, the um, muhajirs and the, the transition and so forth, because I think that that was, I felt like already it was a lot of deep history. But um, I think that the story that, um, that you tell is, you know, I think in many ways very consistent because the party uh, doesn't have grassroots infrastructure in the areas that become Pakistan. Look, and I... I think that there are some really there are some real issues with majority majority minority dynamics and what ends up being uh, colonial India, but the point I want to make about the national narrative um, is, and I think this travels very well to, frankly, I'm I'm quite confident in all the the countries in South Asia, but I think it has you know uh, relevance to other countries in in Southeast Asia, East Asia that I'm beginning to study, which is. When you set up a national narrative that in any way um, makes central a fixed identity, and it can be Islam, like it is in Pakistan, or it can be Buddhism, like it is in Myanmar, what you automatically do is you, you well, I guess there are a couple things that you do. Anybody who doesn't have that core identity is by definition a second class citizen. And I think you know there are lots of people in Pakistan who've written about this, um, uh, but I think you've certainly seen in the decades after independence a core stumbling block for democracy has been over issues of the Ahmadiyas, are they Muslims? You know, to this day, when you're a Pakistani passport, you have to sign. You know, are are is this particular sect a Muslim? And it gets so closely identified, and I think that that creates a really distracting narratives. For, uh, for politics, or really distracting um, kind of identity politics. So, um, and I think that that's exactly what happens, for example, in uh, Myanmar today. So I think you cannot tell the story of why Aung San Suu Kyi is not speaking out without talking about what does it mean to be a Buddhist, uh, to be a, 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 a citizen of Myanmar. And she herself, as her father, has said, to be Burmese is to be Buddhist. And it sets up these you know, incredibly distracting uh, kind of identity politics that's directly led to uh, you know, the crisis in, in Myanmar. Um, I think you, this is a super interesting question that I'm thinking about now is, is Bangladesh, because Bangladesh is, is absolutely um, uh, uh, taking off in, in, in terms of its growth and, and um, uh, in really impressive human development caters, um, much more so than both India and Pakistan. Um, but I think it's interesting. So if you look at Bangladesh's kind of founding struggle, right, in 1971, the founding struggle is actually not about Islam, right? It's about this Bengali identity um, because it's, that's what sets it apart 
from what is at that point West Pakistan. Um, and so um, it has, but on the other hand, it has this um, history of military intervention uh, because it, the Pakistani army, right? So, and we know that there is such a thing as a coup trap. So I think Bangladesh both inherits a relatively inclusive national identity, um, but on the other hand, inherits essentially the legacies of a coup trap. And that's how you see, why you see, I think, the trajectory that you see in Bangladesh have. Um, there's some really you know, great books which have talked about um, the ways in which social structures change in Bangladesh as a result of um, the, the 1971 liberation struggle, in particularly the role of women uh, coming out of, of the households. Um, and and you know, you, I think you mentioned the garment industry in Pakistan and in Bangladesh and how that developed. Um, and there's some, you know, some fascinating stories about how social structures change. But I think, um, I think those are important clarifying questions but I don't see them as kind of fundamentally inconsistent with the stories I tell about national narrative, you know, and, and how they condition prospects for democracy. Okay, I'm afraid we're out of time.